Emmanuel, God is with us. Would you tell the person beside you, God is with us. And tell them he is here. I wanted to share with you today um, how God has been just so personal in, in the way that he is just um, being Emmanuel, God is with us. Um, most of you know that um, my family right now is homeless. But we are living in a hotel. Uh, we've been there for two weeks. And, uh, and so we're, we're still getting used to the, the uh, elbow to elbow kind of existence. And, uh, and now I, I remember one, one time I was uh, driving and I saw a homeless person. And I just started crying because I'm going, gosh, I kind of know what this person is sort of going through because now when, when you're drinking water you're, you're going when we're, we're at a restaurant oh we gotta drink now we gotta drink now because there's no no water at the at the room or something like or you wake up in the middle of the night and you're um when you're just uh, used to going to the to the refrigerator you can't do that anymore because uh, uh you go down to the lobby and the, the water is three dollars uh a bottle so so I'm going. Wow, this is this is um, this is really kind of pushing our, our family to to uh, a, a limit, uh, uh, pushing us in our faith. Um, and uh, just to for those of you who don't know uh, the backstory, um, there was a leak in the hot uh, uh, the the heater, uh, hot water in our house, and, and it. Uh, it flooded the, the the bottom part of our house, and it just warped everything, and and uh, we started smelling mold in the house, and we all started getting sick. So we had to get out of there really fast. Well, yesterday, um, uh, Dr. Gemma uh, just just uh, extracted two wisdom teeth from up here and, and down here, and uh, so um, I'm still doing the codeine. I'm starting to like it, Dr. Gemma. So, <laughs> But uh, when, when I'm not doing that right now, I, I, I should be taking it right now, but I, I haven't taken it because I'm going to be, I don't know what I'm going to be saying up here uh, if I do. Um, so um, anyway, last night I just took the, the, the codeine and then, um, and we haven't had dinner. And so uh, I said, okay, let's load up the car and let's find a, a place to eat. So we were driving, and, uh, and, and my dad, at night, is basically, uh, he can only see about 40%, 50% uh, of the road. So I said, okay, uh, we're gonna let uh, dad drive, and he's basically <laughs> blind at night, or uh, let me drive, uh, half-drunk person because of, of the, the, the medication. So uh, we started, and, and I, I tried to, uh, to drive a little bit, but then I said, no, this is not right. Dad, switch, switch. So uh, we switched, and we were like going 10 miles an hour down the road. And, uh, and, and at first, I was starting to, to, get, to get really frustrated, and, and I was going, Lord, why, uh, why, why this situation? Um, We've been serving you so faithfully, and, and it, it, it just all these things were coming out of my, my mind, and, and, the, and the, the, the mood in the car was just so, so dark and so defeated. And then I just cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord God, help us, help us. Um, it's, it's almost Christmas time. My parents are celebrating their 55th anniversary today. And, uh, and then, so we were... We were down, and, uh, and we, we, were, we were just somewhere in Garland, I don't know where, but we were trying to find a place to eat, and then I just, uh, for some odd reason, we began to laugh in the car, because there was this, this, this half-drunk guy, because of the codeine, the medication, who can't drive, and now this, this, uh, this uh, 82-year-old guy is trying to drive, and he's basically blind at night, and, and, for, uh, and instead of a very defeated, uh, um, glum uh, mood in the car, we just started laughing and we laughed at each other and, and just started enjoying uh, the, the fact that we still have each other. And we, we finally found a place to eat and, and just had the most wonderful, wonderful time. So I was <laughs> like, Lord, only you, only you could have 
uh, done something like that because we were just gonna go back to the hotel and and uh, and probably eat crackers or something. <laughs> but um, but for some odd reason, all of a sudden the, the spirit of the Lord just came upon all of us and and we just had the joy of the Lord in that car, even even in a very very dark situation. So I just thank God because He truly is Emmanuel. God is with us. <laughs> So I'm going to sing this. This um, uh, I, I I wrote new words to to this old um, this old classic. It goes like this. <coughs> Let me see if I can. Have yourself, you know this, a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. You know, you all know this. From now on, our troubles will be out of sight. And I put these new words in. Have yourself a very hopeful Christmas. Let your heart be light. Even though our troubles don't go out of sight, because they never do. Because we know our God is right beside us through the good and bad. Our Messiah, Son of God. So have yourself a very hopeful Christmas now. It's always been my dream to be a sister to come up here and also give us a testimony this lady has just uh, has just been uh, I, I call her her superhero name is spark because when she came to to our church all of a sudden she was like a spark that's all I can I, I can say and uh, I'm going to introduce her and then uh, and you know what, what I mean by by this spark Jess come up here sis My name is Jesse. if you guys um, don't know who I am. I'm actually the first cousin of Pastor Cleo Butch and Lita Cheryl, obviously. Um, we're first cousins, our, our moms are um, sisters. So just a quick background, because I know I can talk a lot, and when it comes to talking about my faith in God, I can talk for hours. So I really had to condense this, because they asked me this morning to say something, and, no, at first I was really nervous. I'm actually a little nervous right now, but not really. So, so bear with me. But um, my past life, um, I wasn't really interested in church. I thought I knew God. Um, you know, we were Catholic. Um, so there's a um, scripture that Elder David shared with me this morning <coughs> as he was telling, asking me about. Um, Say something this, uh, this evening, and it's from 2 Timothy 1 7. And it really resonated with me, and it, it's interesting because he, I guess he also brought it up because it also applies to me. Because um, I consider Elder D David a very, very good friend, and we have similar backgrounds. So there it is. For God gave us a spirit out of fear, but of power and love and self control. 
the pat so I'm gonna read this. I'm sorry, I, I didn't have time to memorize it and I wanted to try to make this short and sweet. So the passage the, this, this passage is the embodiment of my transformation as a Christian. Last year in October 2018, the Holy Spirit told me that I was going to be strengthened and we did, would need to tell others God was real and to call me out the chair. So I thought I was going crazy. I wasn't going crazy. Um, in short, I was going through a lot of things, um, and so the power, love, and self-control, those were the three main things that really spoke to me. And so what I'm gonna do is define them in my own words of how it affected me, how, how God is working in my life. Power, which gave me the ability to physically get up and move from a life of post-surgeries, but my life was steadily declining from addiction, self-pity, self-doubt, to the point I just wanted out. Um, for me, it was very real, because throughout my life, you know, we all pray like, hey God, <coughs> if I do this, or could you give me this, and I'm gonna leverage it, and you know, it doesn't work that way. Um, so, I was like, okay, well, God didn't do this for me. Well, now I understand. Um, he blessed me before with so many things, and I really didn't see it back then. Um, it's interesting because I probably have half the things, not even a quarter of the things I had, and I'm so much happier than I am back then. Because no matter what I did, no matter how much I earned, or whatever things I had, I was never happy. So, love. When I realized I was made for good, and in every, even of my past, consistent disobedience, God was still going to accept me back. The lies I believed in the past are all erased. Uh, I couldn't believe that God would still accept me. Because at the time I thought, well, you know, I was, I did this, I was, you know, I'm not going to be deserving of his love. I mean, I still don't think so, but there's good news. Now, where has, I mean, where was this? I mean, nobody told me. So, that was really, just really um, overpowering for me. Um, I literally felt this big, just heaviness uh, lifted. Um, chains were falling. I had, I couldn't sleep. I had these very bad dreams, almost demonic, and they were gone now. Um, I was able to... Um, to really realize and look back at my life, like I would think, oh my goodness, that was so horrible, but now I realize and I look and I'm like, wait a minute, everything is so backwards, right, in this world. Like all that bad, I realize that like, God really does love me. I would never change it. I would never go back and change it because I wouldn't be who I am. I could say, well, well why did God, why, God, why didn't you save me years ago, you know, in this well, now it's time. Self-control. Because today I can proclaim how God's presence in my life has allowed me to conquer and turn away from depression, addiction, self loneliness self-doubt, violence, and deception. I can be a caring, a gentler, and kinder person. And that's okay. Uh, there is no need for me anymore to fall into my definition or the world's definition of success or uh, beauty or you know, all, all that stuff really doesn't matter. And I can't say, I mean, I, I got baptized here in March and I've seen so many things happen in this church. I've learned so much about myself but my brothers and sisters, and I can tell all of you how important it is for everybody here in this room to always be present, to always care for one another, because it's so important that as a group with our faith, that's magnified. You know, I see, when I think about BCC, I think about this light, this huge light, and every time someone's not here, every time somebody leaves, 
it just gets a little dimmer. So we do have to care because everyone has stake here. Everybody puts something and everyone has purpose. Nothing is a coincidence, you guys. Um, I used to think, oh my goodness, like, how does that happen? I never doubt, doubt things when they happen. So that's really important. So the little things about what people do, we all have our quirks. I know I can be weird, that's fine. But I love, I love God, um, what he's done for me, and he's so real to me. Um, sometimes I can't help it. I have to be careful that I'm Christians, you know, I scare them, that's okay. Um, so I apologize, and I calm down, and even within my, my family, um, and then, you know, the Holy Spirit's like, okay, chill out, like, no, don't, don't, just, just don't, right? Um, so, I used to really love people, I still do, but, you know, with, with life, I got jaded, and then I started to just really, like, just not want to be with people, and I realized when God came to, when, when Christ came to me, it was like, I can't do anything in the four walls of my home. I've got to come out and experience God. And, and if we don't tell each other about God, about what's happened in our lives, people won't know he exists. And I understand that everybody wants to talk to people. I understand that, <coughs> you know, it's, and that's fine. But when you feel prompted to, when you see someone's having a hard time in public, out in the world, smile. I mean, a smile that goes a long way, you guys. Or even hold the door for them. Or ask them if you could put the groceries in the, you know, it, and people, it, it's amazing because when you do that, I'm, I'm kind of sad because sometimes people are really surprised and I'm thinking, wow, people don't do that anymore. But then other times I'm, I'm shocked because there are really still good people out there. And um, if we get over, like, how people look, how they talk, like maybe they're from a different place, we're all people, right? If I cut myself, I cut you, we're bleeding, this is, you know, it's all a show. This does not mean anything. It's what, what counts in your heart is what really matters, okay? So anyway, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here um, because this is my first year as a Christian. And I thought, wow, you know, that Christmas means a lot more to me than any time in my life. But for me, yes, I understand, this is when Christ was born, but for me every day, I, I, I thank God for being in my life, for being there. For being so every day should be Christmas. So, you know, just everyone keep the faith. Try to support each other. If you can, share it out there. There's so many people out there who are lost and who need it. And there's so much love. Like, I know it's, we're all under one father, but I'm not jealous of Ariana. If God loves Ariana, there's so much love. It, it flows through. Or, like, it, it, it's, there's enough for everybody. There's more than enough for everybody. So, you know, share it. Um, it, it. It makes a whole, it makes a difference. And I, I just, I can't, sometimes I get very upset because I, I, sometimes it's hard to get through to certain people, but it's okay. Like, just do your part, let's be obedient. We can all be obedient together. Help, hold each other accountable. I do, I tell people that all the time. If they don't see me here on Sunday, they'll call me. So anyway, thank you so much and um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Yeah. Well, let's all stand. Jess and, and the Heights, come up, come up here, come up here. We're going to sing one of Jess's, uh, this is the, her uh, audition song for Heights. And this means a lot to her, so I'm gonna have her sing the, the, the help us and lead the people to the song. So repeat this after me, everybody. For God. Come on, I can't hear you. For God. Gave us. The spirit. Not of fear. But of power. Of love. And self-control. Right. Amen. Go. 
this guy that I'm going to call next, uh, oh, one of my very dearest, uh, dearest guys in my heart. Um, I, I've seen him grow up, and, and um, I'm going to call him up here, and he's so terrified, so we all be, be very kind and nice uh, to Aaron as we call him up here. Aaron, come up here. Testify about God is with us. Tell us. Come here, come here. Um, Aaron is also fulfilling another one of my dreams, and that is to have uh, to be a talk show host. So I'm going to be uh, interviewing him because he's so nervous. Yeah, I know. I'm very So, yes, Aaron. So, uh, welcome to the David Kalabi Show. <laughs> Yeah, okay, this is the Emmanuel show. Aaron, so uh, do you want to sit down? Uh, no, okay. You're okay? Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. Aaron, so um, would you tell everybody what happened to you uh, just recently? Just recently? Okay. Um, so about a month ago, um, I was switched in the hospital um, for having heart failure. Um, and you wouldn't think such a young kid or a young guy, well, thinking like a young guy that I would have that. And um, for the longest time, um, like who David said, I grew up in his church. Um, ever since I was 10, I was here um, with Athamanel, Pastor Roach. Um, and growing up in a very close community. All right. So um, um, I would learn that you know, that God is is with you, working wonders and miracles, and um, you know the church is Christ. And when Good Dave called my sister at two thirty this afternoon, and she gracefully passed me the baton <laughs> to get up here, and I kind of thought, like, what would I say? Um, <coughs> But what does it mean to have Christ with you? And um, this is it. Um, being a part of this church has been one of the greatest things. I told you, kid, I'm going to cry. Um, Take your time, brother. Take your time. So um, even even when you think that um, you can go on your own and and um, do everything in your own power, it's not the real power at home. Um, it really is God as your driver that. That you know that leads your life, and it pulls you back and reminds you of what you have and who is it with you. And so here I am today, thanking everyone. <laughs> Not just the fighters, but coming to the hospital, um, seeing me, supporting my family and really just being a perfect example of who Christ is and what he has done for us. Um, if we're not who he is, we won't be anything. So, good news. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. so brother, if you can think, um, just capture, uh, was there one, uh, a verse or a, or uh, somebody said that uh, really helped you and get you through? After you did that, it was great. Um, so I've been reading the book of Philippians, and there is a, there's a verse, Philippians 2.13. It says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. And so that has been... Um, a big verse for me lately is because um, even up to now, God is still working in me and, and 
is still shaping me and molding me to whatever it is that he needs me to do that pleases him and for him. So I've been meditating on that and just saying, God, here I am. Um, you pulled me back. Now, where do I go from here? So where do you go from here, brother? That's a good question for you. <laughs> But wherever that will be, you can be sure that God is with you. Yes. So God is with you, just go with God. Go with God. Let's sing that, that one verse again, because that reminds me of uh, what, what, what you went through, brother. <laughs> Every single day, 
Um, and you know, for me personally, I think there's so many changes coming in my life in 2020, and it's it's kind of horrifying. It's kind of terrifying. The future, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and even in, in 2019, I had a lot of moments of fear and anxiety and doubt. Uh, and then what's so crazy is that I was like thinking about it. There was actually a moment where I was in Vancouver. I direct commercials for a living, um, TV commercials and things like that. And it may seem like uh, sometimes it's fun and easy and sometimes it's like the pressure is really, really intense and really wild and really scary. Uh, and there was a moment in 2019 when I was in Vancouver and I was directing this commercial and it was the night before and I was like, I was trying so hard not to throw up. I was like over the toilet like, just so anxious and so nervous and so fearful. Um, I remember texting Bianca and being like, Bianca, I need you to pray for me, like so bad. And uh, like always, she sends me like the most incredible text and prayer that night and the next morning that really put my mind at ease. But I started thinking about Jesus in the garden. And I'm thinking, here's a guy that God has made flesh and he is in the garden the night before his crucifixion and he's literally like, He's so anxious and he's so nervous and he's so fearful and he's sweating. He said it's like it's like blood. He's so he knows what he's facing the next day. He knows what he's about to about to stare down. And it's kind of this pivotal moment where he he kind of has an option to run and he has an option to turn away from that. His his buddies, his disciples are asleep, and he has this choice sort of in that moment to be courageous and to be brave in the face of the most ridiculous anxiety you could ever imagine and in the face of the most ridiculous uh, and terrifying force of uh, God's wrath that's bearing down on him. And there's so many times in my life when I think about Jesus in the garden and I think about the integrity and the courage um, and the bravery to stick through it even when he's asking for God to pass the cup from him. Um, and God's kind of like Instead of saying, okay, he just says, you know, either nothing or no, you know, like, you're going to do this, I'm sorry. And Jesus accepts that, he does it. And I think that's really cool about Christianity, because I think that that's a God who, um, when we're feeling nervous and anxious and we're staring down the barrel of something really daunting, um, it can be your career, it can be personal, whatever it may be. We serve a God, and we know a God that knows that feeling to the, to the to the most infinite degree, you know. And He stuck with it, and He stood in there, and He took the punch um, for us, so that we could be with Him. Um, so when I think about Emmanuel, I think about God with us. I, I think about in a personal way, um, just being able to um, reflect on that, and being able to relate to Jesus in that way is really cool. Um, and it's something really special. So, yeah, not that's not him as a baby in a manger, but him at the end of his life. But it's still it's the thing I always think about around Christmas, um, which is kind of wild. So, yeah, that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Around this time, a few 
uh, a month before December, maybe October somewhere, entering November. I, I was expecting to have a son because Madel was pregnant with, uh, this was like, how, how, what, how many years back was that? The group then? Huh? 14? 15? About 14 years ago, uh, there was the breaking news that uh, we were going to have a baby. And I knew in my heart that I was going to finally have my dream. I had two girls, and I was praying for a baby boy, because that completes the equation, so to speak, in my thing, in my estimate, in my calculation. So, I couldn't contain it. I was in a baseball, I, I was in a, a football uh, homecoming thing, and Manel and I were watching, because Bianca was, I think, also there, and uh, Manel was pregnant. And I was making sure that Manel could, could not slide on, 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 on the ground and I would be very careful because she's pregnant and that's my baby boy. And then, you know the story, we lost the baby. We lost, the, I even gave him a name, look Daniel. So we lost the boy. And it didn't make any sense. Like, wh why would you... Uh, even introduce the possibility that that I would have I, that I would be a father to a boy, and then God, you're going to take him home. It doesn't make any sense. Wrestling with a crisis of faith. There are many things in in, in my Christian journey that 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 when I process things, it doesn't make any sense. Like the Christmas story. Uh, Mary was 14 years old, 14, 15, 16, right around the ballpark, when some angel shows up to an ordinary, regular, provincial Jewish girl. An angel. This is where the bottom meets the road, if you really believe this. <laughs> the angel speaks and tells this teenager that she's going to be pregnant something that's problematic there because they're very strict back in the days. So she's never been kissed, she's never been hugged. And then this angel, yes, she, she has a, a she, she was betrothed, that's the equivalent of engaged, but never been kissed, never been hugged. But the angel said, guess what Mary, your most favorite? You'll have a baby. And the baby is not ordinary. He is Emmanuel, the one who will redeem and save the entire world. I'd like for us to enter the heart and the mind of Mary. I'd like for you to go back to as far back as when you were 14. And think of something that might be the equivalent of that weird. <laughs> uh, reality that someone speaks to you and tells you something that you cannot even grasp, that your mind cannot even grasp, because there's nothing in your world that would provide any sense that that's going to happen. Because you're a virgin. You've never been kissed. You have a boyfriend, but your parents are strict. You've never been touched. And then this angel shows up and tells you that you're going to be pregnant. You're a virgin. Did you have one like that when you were 14, 15, and 16? Someone told you something and, and you kind of like you laughed probably. But Mary, most unusual about her character, and perhaps this is the reason why God chose her, is because she just accepted the terms of God. There's such purity. In my thinking, what was she thinking? How can she explain this? Because when the angel spoke to her, uh, the angel 
told her all the great things about the baby, and then the angel disappeared. It gave her a few pointers that uh, her cousin Elizabeth, who was also barren, was also expecting a baby. And then that's it. Your, your baby is going to be great because he's the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. Your most favored. I'd like for us to enter Mary, heart and soul and mind. If you were Mary, if that's true, and we know it's true, <coughs> and an angel shows up and tells you that, and then the angel disappears, and you're left alone with a word like that. You have a boyfriend, <coughs> and you've got strict parents, and this thing is going to grow. What are you going to do? How are you going to explain that to your boyfriend? You go to your boyfriend and say, honey, you know what? Did you notice my, my tummy is getting bigger? Did you notice that? Yeah, I kind of like notice that. It's, it's about an angel that spoke to me and told me that I was going to get pregnant. You think the boyfriend is going to believe that? I was thinking, was Mary, uh, did, did Mary have the strength to talk to the parents who were very strict and, and tell mom, dad, uh, can I have a talk, a serious talk with you? Because I think I'm pregnant because I just went to the bathroom and I vomited. <coughs> it's not an easy thing. I think I'm pregnant. But, but, but please don't, don't jump into conclusion. It's not Joseph. My boyfriend, it's, it's, it, an angel showed up and told me that I was going to get pregnant. I was processing that. You have strict parents who talk to them about an angel. How can she contain that? But, but, do I have things like that in my life where God tells me something that I cannot process? That's something that's beyond me, but God says so. Do you have things like that in your life? When you read the Bible, God has a promise for you. You, have, you are in an impossible situation, but God tells you otherwise that He's going to take care of you. Do, do you, how do you handle that? How do you process that? Because God made a promise. I know your situation, but the most important thing here is that I am Emmanuel. I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I know exactly what you what you're going through, and and just because I am God, I happen to know how to handle your situation, and I will be on top of your situation if you allow me. Because time is of the essence. You are in a real situation. And the timing calls for me. Did you get that? The timing calls for me that you surrender completely. And you trust me completely. Because time is of the essence. You can actually walk away and not believe. Then I will not be able to do my stuff. <laughs> Because before I do my stuff, I'm looking for willing Marys. I'm looking for simple and ordinary Marys who when I talk to them, they would take my word for it. So, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, am I like a Mary who, when, when God talks to me, when I open the Bible, and I'm in a very difficult spot, when God tells me something, and it's too good to believe, <coughs> am I like Mary? God said it. I should believe this. I, I don't get this because I don't see how it's going to happen. But He tells me this. So God, I don't know how to receive this, but I am receiving it. <coughs> I just want to be like Mary, 14 years old. Just takes you at your word, and that's it. And because she, she takes you at your word, then you deliver on time, 
And so as we think of Luke chapter 2, we read the Christmas story, and there's this thing that's popped up, just one verse, uh, uh, Luke 2, 6, and, and it says, it, it says here, I just read this, while they were there in Bethlehem, because they were uprooted from, Galilee, uh, from uh, their little town in uh, Nazareth, and while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. This one to camp on that. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. <coughs> that is what God promised. <coughs> you will be pregnant. And the time will come. And the baby is going to be born in real time and in real space. And the time came for the baby to be born. And there's no stopping the hand of God. And we know who Jesus is. And we know what Jesus did. It's very interesting that when, when Jesus was born in the most ordinary of places, we missed a significant detail. Because uh, Mary, for lack of uh, They, they, they were uprooted, and so they, there was not even a room. There's not even a, uh, a decent place to give birth. And so you just have to make do with what's there. And do, do you happen to know what materials he used to wrap the baby with? Because here, here in North America, when you give birth to a baby, it's all sanitized. They make sure everything is sanitized, the clothing and whatnot. But when you are in the, in the situation, uh, they were in that manger, and Mary gave birth. Uh, do you recall w w what material Mary used? It, it's there. It's called swaddling clothes. Do you know what swaddling clothes? Swaddling clothes, and some scholars are specific in this. It says, they, they say, some scholars, say, that provides an important dynamic and detail in this story. Scholars say that that's exactly the same cloth that's used to wrap dead people when they die. Like mummies, when they're dead back in the days, you wrap them with swaddling cloths to make sure that it's tight. So I was thinking, I was thinking maybe there was not much provision and, and there was some swaddling clothes but but that was that was the reason why the baby was born the baby was born to to die to redeem and save Jesse to provide healing for Aaron to make sure that David and his parents would have a home to make sure that Marcus would understand what this life is all about. And for me to have the strength to know that this is not a joke. <coughs> See, everything about God's timing is perfect. And so, going back to Luke Daniel, uh, uh, 15 years ago, I thought that was it. There's no chance. So whenever I, I see uh, uh, some, some parents or boys like Ken, you got sacked there. Uh, when, when I see some of you guys, I, I do have a silent gas that I will never have a boy. I know what it is to, 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 to be a boy to a dad. Because my dad, uh, flawed as he was, tried his best to, to walk with me and teach me stuff about life. I know it's, it's, it's amazing, it's incredible when, when a dad uh, journeys with a son. I know, I know I'm not going to get that. It was tearing me apart. And probably that's the reason why I was pretending that Bianca and Nika were boys. I would teach them karate and jujitsu. <laughs> I'd play basketball with them. And, and I would 
force them to be strong and be boy-like. And, uh, and then I would quit and say, ah, oh, they're not boys. I can never have a boy. That's it. I'm the son. But this morning, I rose early. I went to the gym. I had a ball. I had a grown-up son. His name is Marcus. We had one and one. Best of three. I lent him my basketball shoes because he left his in New York. I gave him my best shoe and I told him you better win because this is my turf. We play the game. <coughs> we are of the same height, you know. Six feet one. And he was playing his game, but I was in a different plane. I was thinking about this passage, that I was so wrong about putting a period on what God can do. Because I have a son. I'm playing basketball right now with a son. And he beat me. And I, could, and I was not even hurt. Because that's my son. It's just the coolest thing. And, oh God, this is too good. Uh, the things that are impossible. How can you like have a son when it's no longer possible? And God breaks the barrier of time and space and gives you a son. <coughs> and keep up. And keep up. This is too good. And guess what? There's a promise in scriptures. That's too good. That says you and I. <coughs> are going to live forever and stay together <coughs> and like be together and no one ever suffers toothache and never has to take that crazy medication no one no one no one gets invaded by cancer and, and no one celebrates birthday anymore because it doesn't matter because it's eternity and no one dies crazy. Can you fathom that? Well, no one can fathom that because we die. We, are, we age quickly. How can I fathom that? But God said it. Time will come. When the last enemy on planet Earth called death will disappear. Because I have good news to be. I came to kill death because I'm life and he who comes to me will have life just because I'm Emmanuel. You can only do this if you accept my terms and take me seriously when I say if you take me seriously and you invite me to be your Lord and Savior and when I say stuff and you take me seriously. And you don't take me like some, I'm some kind of a joke. I promise you one thing. All the things that I promise you will come delivered according to time. <coughs> there is no impossible thing before me. I'd like for you to turn to your seatmates. And I'd like for you to think of something that you think is impossible now. It's time bound, okay? Maybe you're waiting and say, you know, I've been waiting for so long. I think this is impossible. It's not going to happen. But somehow there's something in me when I read the Bible that's telling me that it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. I just want to let you in on this. I'm going to tell you this. Can you please pray for my faith that I'll be like Mary? Because the reason why I'm doing this is I want every person tonight to receive something. And I want for you to share something 
to a person. Let the person know that you're struggling with this. But God is saying something otherwise. It's going to happen. I'd like for you to speak it. I like what David said. Let's put the equation of hope. And tell the other person, you know, can you pray for me? Because I don't think this is going to happen. But I have a problem because God's telling me, I know it, that it's going to happen. What is it? I don't know what it is. But I want every person here. You think of something that's time bound. Maybe you've been waiting for it. Maybe it's a longing in your heart. And, and somehow you, you know it came from God. But you can't see how it's happened. It's going to happen. You, you know, but you, you don't see how it's going to happen. Okay? I'll give you a good 10 minutes to go back and forth. Maybe five minutes for you, share it to the person next to you. And then five minutes, give the other person. And then I'll close in prayer. And then we'll lift all these things to the Lord. Please, every person, look for something. All right, next to you. That's convenient.
Father, the hands are clasped together because apart from your promises that are forced through the body of Christ, we will not be able to see clearly. Aaron just spoke and he is a man who is just recovering and he's sitting right now in his car not feeling well again. Okay because he's still recovering the rape of mercy for his soul. There are many things that have been shared that are intensely personal, one and one. And these are the desires of your people that you place in their hearts and in their minds. And without the help of Jesus, our Redeemer, they will remain longings and Nothing's going to be done. But tonight, you, we have come to terms with the timing of God. Because when God says to a virgin that I need you to take me seriously, the timing will come that it's going to happen. And so I pray, I join my brothers and my sisters here for most unusual reception of your blessing. That you would teach us to take your word seriously. That you might be diligent in seeking your wisdom, your counsel, your provision, your strength, your wonder. That if there's anything that's impossible, we will not turn to the impossible situation and bury ourselves in pity and in paralysis. But we will turn to you and say, God, this is impossible, but you are my God. And so I bring it up to you. Do whatever you need to do with that. Because you have granted me this desire. I live it up to you. And it's up to you what you want to do with that. I'm just going to watch you do your thing. I pray, would you please, oh God, in the manner by which you were intentionally personal with Mary. I pray for every person in this room. Be personal. And show them why you are the Messiah. How you are the Messiah. Where you are 
as the Messiah. When you are the Messiah and what you mean when you say that you are the Messiah. Today, we celebrate the timing of that birthday that when you said and you spoke to a young teenager that she was going to get pregnant because you said so. Because you had a plan to redeem the world in the most ordinary of circumstances. I pray that in the most serious, the most ordinary of our circumstances, there is no such thing as ordinary. There is no such thing as small before you. Everything that's brought to you is grand and big because you pay attention to your children. You made the promise, Emmanuel, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. Take me seriously. I am your God. Father, I pray for us. Let us be like Mary. Happy birthday, Jesus. May you receive the promise of your Savior that all is going to be well just because He is God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed Christmas, one and all.
somebody in the catch my kids. Your son is uh, amazing. We, we missed him last night. So if we have a Christmas party. And, you know, his phone is not. I'm trying to communicate with him, but this time I'm going to communicate with him. Uh, so, yeah, so that I can have a communication with her because uh, we're doing like, we have like a, a couple more caroling this weekend. Uh, we want, uh, last night we had our Christmas party. And we just, uh,